Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> So here we are again. It's another episode of the Two Shot Podcast. Thank you so much for downloading and subscribing. I'm very pleased you're here, and I'm also very pleased to tell you that this week's guest is the quite brilliant Sanjeev Bhaskar. Myself and producer Griff travel to London again. Seems to be where all the actors live. Um, And he welcomed us into his home, and we sat down, and we had... A beautiful chat, a really lovely, honest, revelatory chat for me. Um, we'd we'd met, um, I didn't know loads about him, and it was a very honest and sensitive talk, um, and I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud he was on. Uh, he's a good man, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. This is Sanjeev Bhaskar. <laughs> Well, we're all brewed up. We're sat down. We're here. This is perfect. Sanjay Basca, how are you today? Yeah, I'm very good, thanks. I'm very good. It's really nice to see you. It's lovely to see you. Thanks so much for welcoming us uh, into your beautiful home. Thanks. thanks. I can't take any credit for that. But well, we've just had some lovely cake. We're brewed up. We're ready to yeah. go. Um, first off, I just want to get this out of the way. Is it true that you uh, used to live above a laundrette? Yeah. Did you? In Ealing? Yeah, yeah uh, I was born in Ealing and then Hounslow, which is kind of uh, uh, well, probably under one of the flight paths to Heathrow. Um, it's still in West London. My dad bought a laundrette and there was the flat above it, the masonette above oh, it. Oh, it was your dad's did. laundrette? Yeah, my dad kind of bought the laundrette. My dad worked as well, so he was doing both. He was had a job in a factory and um, he was running the laundrette as well. So. And how, do you, how many brothers and sisters have you got? I've got a younger sister. She's that about all? five years younger, yeah. And what does she do? She is, uh, well, she was a, a producer in radio and TV. She got into sort of that part of the media before I did. Um, but yeah, she did radio journalism and then worked on various music programs and then kind of ended up um, being a deputy commissioner at Channel 4 for a while. And then she gave that up and have a family and stuff like that. So yeah, that kind of stuff. And... Did you go to school in Hounslow? Yeah. How was that for you? Um, <clears throat> well, it was interesting. I mean, it's a weird thing. So, so infants and junior school um, were, you know, there weren't many Asians in the area at that time. It's quite an Asian area now. Uh, but it wasn't at that time. So I think there was about three Asian kids in the infant school. And I can't remember who... who uh, to attribute this quote to, but somebody said, you know, other people let you know about racism. And so when I think back on it, at the time you just accept, there's any kid, you accept the reality that you're given. But uh, when I look back on it, I can see that there were, from some of the older teachers particularly, kids are kind of fine. They just get on with it. And they just accept you for who you are. You You say that, you know, your name's kind of Piglet, they'll call you Piglet. I mean, it's kind of, you know... Sometimes they don't know better. They don't know any better anyway, do they? No. And yeah. so, again, that's the reality you're giving them, and yeah. so that's what they accept. But um, so there were kind of few issues, I remember, with the teachers now, probably more retrospective than at the time, uh, with one teacher in particular, uh, Mrs Youngman, who's probably no longer around. I know, but still, still, if there's anything about it, let's name and shame, I think. I, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not that kind of podcast, but if we want to go there, it I, can be anything we want. I feel safe in the knowledge that she was pretty old then. Okay. Actually. She, she looked like uh, John Pertwee. Uh, Wurzel Gummidge-esque. More Doctor Who, actually, oh, right. than Wurzel Gummidge. Um, but she was horrible, and she was particularly <laughs> horrible to me. Um, I was kind of good at English. I was good early on i was an early reader and stuff like that way ahead of my class and she just couldn't handle that and i remember her telling my mum that my mum shouldn't she said to my mum do you sort of you know read with him and teach 
English at home? And my mum said yes. Uh, my mum had been an English teacher in India before she came here. And she said, no, I don't think you should. It's kind of like he's, he's you know, disrupting the class. Because he, and it was, and I'm, because I remember I was the first kid in the class to be able to spell submarine. And th- she was incensed by that. And you look back on it, you try to find other reasons for it, just to be generous. But yeah. there were none, really. She was kind of like closet, not particularly closet, kind of Nazi John Pertwee lookalike. Out there, my God, that's awful. It was at the time you just kind of deal with it yeah. as you go on. And then by the time I got to junior school, that was generally quite happy. There were more Asian kids there, and that was kind of fine. And then I went to secondary school. I went to a comp, uh, which was uh, about a mile and a half from where I lived, and that was all right for the first few years. My last few years there were pretty challenging. So, and I think. I mean, I'm grateful for those experiences now, but they really were very formative. In, uh, in, in what way were they challenging? Well, kind per- of... Personally or, or in educationally? A bit of both. I mean, I, I, the teachers weren't particularly good. You know, classes were huge. Uh, so educationally, it wasn't great. It's much better now. I've kind of been back since. It, it looks like a great school. But at that time, that wasn't so good. But also... Uh, you know, at that time, early 80s, they were kind of, you know, racism was pretty much on the streets. It was kind of pretty overt. So the National Front would be marching, you know, around and they would recruit outside the school. And uh, and there was about, about a third of the school was kind of uh, non-white. So it was a sizable minority. So there was a lot of tension within the school as well. And uh, there was, I remember there was a day when I kind of came in and one of the sort of like, you know, more prominent Asian characters came up to me and he said, listen, you can't speak to white people anymore. And I said, right, I don't know if it's escaped your attention where we're living, but it may be a bit difficult. And he said, no, you can't talk to any of the white kids in the school because it's kind of, it's us versus them. And I said, well, they've done nothing to me, so I'm not going to stop talking to them. And he said, you know, well you're either with us or you're against us. And I said, oh, I'm not with anyone or against anyone. So I started to get chants from the kind of uh, uh, the Asian kids, particularly of white man, white man, white man, whenever the, I kind of came in school. And one of the things that kind of, uh, again, retrospectively troubled me about that was that it was just a really poor saying to come up with. I mean, if they'd asked me, I would have come up with something better <laughs> than simply white man. And I got the packy stuff anyway from, from, the, from the white kids. So yeah. it, was, it was a great lesson for me in terms of uh, finding your tribe because I suddenly realised that it, actually it wasn't based on uh, gender, it wasn't based on colour, it wasn't based on culture. Uh, you know, all of those things can, you know, help or help you find a way or add to it or, or whatever, but... None of those things uh, were what was central to who I was. Yeah. Um, Did you speak to your parents about what was going on at school? Because, you know, sometimes, banging the mic, when things happen at school, mm. they happen at school and they stay in school. Sometimes the parents don't know about it. I was wondering, would your parents have been worried about that? Yeah, so I didn't tell them. Yeah. Um, Also, I think that from really early on, from probably from about the age of five, I got the sense that I understood the, um, you know, the, the the popular culture better than my parents did. So, you know, whether it was, you know, um, whether it was slang, whether it was kind of being street white, whatever it, whatever it was, you know, to be able to fit in in Britain, I understood better than they did. So I was quite protective of them, probably from about four or five years old, from quite young. Yeah. You know? So my earliest, mem- earliest memory is two and a half. So from there, I've got f- sort of sporadically very vivid memories. It's, but being protective of them was one of them. So I thought, you know, I could tell them about this, but there's nothing they can do about yeah. it. And so they will worry and they wouldn't ha- necessarily have the resource to, to be able to help me. I didn't feel at that time. So I, I said nothing to them at all. They found out kind of like years later when mm. we did an interview and stuff. Um, but also by that time, my sister, who was sort of four and a half years younger, uh, was also in the school and I was desperate for her not to find out. So I kind of carried on as normal uh, through all of that. But then when I got into the lower six, by that time, it built up. A, that had dissipated. 
Yeah. And but what built up ahead of steam was this kind of like mob mentality thing. Uh, and you know, as a kid, you want to belong, you want to feel different, but you want to belong. And I think that's the conflict that every kid has. Yeah. Um, so in the sixth form, and we had about 115 people in the sixth form, they all stopped talking to me. That was for about, that was from September to January. Oh. And again, that was just a sort of mob mentality thing. Yeah. You know, prominent people kind of that like engineered that uh, situation and everybody else kind of went along with it because they didn't, you know, who are you going to side with? Yeah. And um, so again, that was another great sort of life lesson for me. And it sounds like, I don't know if this is right, but it sounds like you you grew up very quickly in quite a short space of time. Because you said you were being very protective of, of your parents. It's almost like you became the man of the household a bit. Yeah, and protective of my sister as well, yeah, because course. I didn't want her to find out. So um, I remember my mum saying, you know, to me on weekends, you know, why don't you go out with your friends? I mean, and I'd kind of go, no, it's all right. I'm going kind to, of, I'm going to read and blah, blah, blah. But uh, you know, after six months, uh, you know, the September to January thing, again, that petered out because people just got bored with yeah. it. But, uh, it's but at the certainly... time, I'm sure. It... It, you, you go into survival mode, I think. And I think that's what I did. I Because yeah. no one would sit next to me in class. So, and the breaks and lunch times and stuff, I went to the library and just kind of made myself busy. And I think that outwardly, I think, do you know what? I, when I think back on it, when I, because I've met other people since who've been through similar things at that age, you know, uh, some of them uh, dealt with it very well and some of them didn't deal with it particularly well at all. And I kind of, it made me kind of think about what what got me through it. Now there was, yeah, the protective stuff. and uh, But I think, I remember there was a moment where I thought, gosh, there's 114 people who are telling me that I'm sort of, Worthless piece of shit. They had a they, they put a notice up on the six form notice board in the um, common area, uh, which were the ten most hated people in the six form. And I took up the first four places. It was no. my name four times before it got to someone else. And uh, I remember thinking, gosh, there's 114 people telling me I'm sort of like you know uh, worthless. You know, there's maybe they're right. You know, and then I remember thinking or maybe they're all wrong. And I just had a sliver of arrogance or, or whatever. Strength, it sounds like to me. My God. It's, yeah, it's a trick. I mean, it, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, strength is probably not a word that I would use. I, again, it was survival and it was, but I saw it out, you know, it kind of, uh, I never uh, forgot it. No, of course. Um, but uh, there was an interesting thing a, a few years later when I first started working, I first started appearing on TV. And there was a guy that I bumped into who uh, I was at school with who then bumped into someone else. And this someone else was saying, uh, Steve was the guy uh, that kind of started talking to me uh, after a few months. He bumped into someone else. And the Steve said to him, he said, oh, do you keep in touch with anyone from school? And this other guy, Harry or whatever, was saying, oh, yeah, so, so-and-so. And he said, blah, 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 he's kind of head of IT at this place. You know, he's done, he's done the best out of everyone because he's kind of like, you know, head of IT. I mean, that's just <laughs> fantastic. And he went through a few other names. And Steve said, well, Sanjay's done quite well. You know, he's on TV and everything. And Harry said to him, yeah, he hasn't done as well as Pierce Brosnan, though, has he? <laughs> and I remember thinking, you, ha- you think it's an insult. My goodness, you've just moved me in a completely different category. <laughs> Um, so I think it was, uh, you know, the, the protectiveness, certainly a, a touch of arrogance maybe, but also, uh, I've been really lucky in that I've, f- from very early on, I was able to find the ridiculous in situations. So it leaves you in a position with no one's interacting with you, of being an observer. Mm. Um, but also I could spin it off into the kind of, you know, you know, ridiculous kind of uh, extremes of the situation that was in. So in many ways, it kind of sounds more bleak than it felt at the time. But be- but I was constantly managing it, I think. Um, which, you know, wasn't pleasant, but, you know, also neither did I have a breakdown at the time. Of so. course. That's what you say, you know, you survived. You went into yeah. survival mode, I like that. Mm. So did you have any... You know, we know that you're very ahead 
English and you, you did you enjoy doing that? Or was it something that just came naturally to you, the reading and uh, it just came naturally to me, I think. I kind of, I always enjoyed any form of storytelling. So, um, you know, there's a lot of that in English, obviously, history, uh, religious studies, you know, all of these became stories. And so yeah. it, th- those were more interesting stories than, for me, than, you know, the story of the electron, <laughs> uh, stuff like that, <laughs> you know, the story of science. I mean, fascinating those, though they are in their yeah. own way, but, uh, so, yeah, it was anything that was connected with storytelling, I think, I was drawn to. And was there any drama on your curriculum? Uh, there was at secondary school. And th- this was a kind of big lesson that I learned. So, uh, you know, I kind of thought first three years of secondary school, you all had to do drama and then you choose your options for your um, GCSEs and all mm. that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, drama was something I really loved. I mean, it was, it was... And I was... And I thought at the time I was better than the other people. Which, to be quite honest, has now been borne out. I mean, <laughs> where the hell are they? Uh, and uh, and at the end of the third year, I remember I got such an average report from the teachers, and I think it was one that they just gave to everyone. It was one of those is working hard makes pleasing is making pleasing progress mm. things. And I was so hurt by this. I mean, I, you know, I was relatively shy as a kid. I was funny, but I, uh, I was shy. And I remember going up to the teachers uh, when they were going to do the the the, uh, the award ceremonies and stuff. And I said, you know, do you think I'm in with the chance for the drama award? And they said, no, there's this girl in the year above you and she's brilliant. And I went, oh, okay, okay. So I got to, you know, the, the third year, average report. And I thought, do you know what? Just to teach you a lesson, I'm not going to do drama. And then you'll be sitting there <laughs> wondering where that guy who was really good has gone. So the other option that I had, if not drama, was it was called technical drawing then. So you had to draw bolts and yeah. bits of engines and stuff. And I remember being in the technical drawing class, looking outside and seeing all these people kind of like running and freezing and being trees. And, and I remember thinking, I want to do that. And of course, the teachers didn't remember, didn't recall at all. The only person who was damaged to do that was me. So. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a lesson learned. But, yeah, 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 totally. Uh, but yeah, that was it. I didn't do any productions at school. So where did you pick it back up, the drama after that? Was what did we do? What did, where did where did we go after school? Did you go to university? I did. Yeah. What, um, what were you majoring there? I did um, business studies and marketing. So I did a degree in business and marketing. And I remember going to the, they had a kind of free choice drama thing. So you know, people who could do it on like the drama society, I suppose, mm. you know, on the weekends and stuff. I remember going along to that and I remember thinking if I'm not better than these people who just want to do it on the weekend, all these kind of mathematicians and accountants and all that kind of stuff, if I'm not better than them, then I really shouldn't be thinking about this as any kind of, even dreaming about this as a career is just wrong. So you you were dreaming about it at this point? Oh, I was dreaming about it since from about three. Really? Yeah, yeah. So this is... I mean, it, this sounds like a gag, but it's absolutely true. But uh, uh, I remember, I don't know, four or five years old. I was really young. And some friend of the family came around and, you know, they said, this is uncle, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, hello, young man. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, actor. And my dad said, it's pronounced doctor. <laughs> and my mum verifies that. My dad denies it, of course. <clears throat> but, uh, so, yeah, it was really early, four or five years old. I mean, I remember finding... When I was about six, I found a prospectus in our house under a bed um, for Pinewood Studios. Uh, and I found it, there were two. There was Pinewood Studios and Twickenham Studios were the two uh, that I found. And you know, I said to my parents, I said, where, where have these come from? And you know, my dad said, oh, someone left them. Someone left them in the shop downstairs in the laundrette. And I kind of poured through these things and I loved them. I mean, I didn't understand what they were talking about, but they were... Yeah. These were, uh, this, the prospectus was from a, the late 50s, maybe. And they had sort of scenes of back projection and, they, and a tank. And they were saying, you know, this is how we do the kind of, this is where this was filmed and that was filmed. And, and I just found all of it fascinating. And the coda to that actually is about, so when I was about, gosh, I'd been doing this for about eight or nine years. I then found out that my dad, who came to Britain in 1956, 
had been passionate about film and uh, had got together with a couple of friends and had gone to the studios to say, how do we make a film? I mean, do we, how do we hire space and all that kind of stuff? Picked up all these books, came back. My dad then said he went to, he attended night school, which was, and he said it was called the London School of Film Technique, which was in Brixton. So he had to get tubes and buses and stuff from where he was um, because he wanted to be a filmmaker. And wow. my, my um, aunt, my dad's sister, was widowed at that time, about 1960 or 61 or something. And she had four children who were under the age of nine. So my dad kind of uh, uh, elected to kind of help them out. So he took extra jobs and basically gave up on, on all that stuff and then never talked about it. So really? from me, for me, from sort of four or five years old, talking about acting and talking about films and talking about, you know, all this kind of stuff, he just never engaged with it. And I always thought he was quite down on it. And later I found out it was because he didn't want me to go through the same kind of dream-crushing scenario that he'd gone through, which was the disappointment and stuff. Obviously, being the protective father. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which was kind of uh, weird. So, yeah, from really early on, I was kind of, I was quite passionate about it. Because you, you, you mentioned before that you were quite shy yeah. when you were growing up. Did you feel that by becoming somebody else, you had a bit of a new lease of life where you could project who you wanted to be instead of this, this shy lad? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, actors are shy yeah. and uh, it's... It's putting on a mask. It's kind of, you know, it's being able to inhabit. It's, it's being given permission by a character to behave in a way that you wouldn't necessarily behave. And um, and also it's a moment, a personal moment of reinvention. And so for me, trying to fit in and trying to work out how and where I fitted in, because you know, I didn't look like everyone else, but I kind of, I spoke better than everyone else. Um, you still speak better than everyone well, else. Well, I, I think that's very nice of you to say. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, in that sense, maybe I was partly drawn to it because of that. I remember kind of when I was six or seven, it was, I remember going swimming with school and I remember thinking, God, this is just, you know, I say my name and people go, what? Hey, you know, it's uh, three or four goes at it. And I remember thinking, I'm going to be Steve. I'm going to be Steve. <laughs> and I remember going to the swimming pool and the kids who went from our school go, oh, all right, what's your name? And I said, Steve, Steve. And they went, Steve, yeah, Steve. And then later they, they all shouted, Steve, Steve. And I wasn't turning around. <laughs> and I kind of had to give up on that. It just wasn't very good. But um, I didn't like my name. You didn't? No. Why? Because there was no other Craigs. I didn't know any other Craig in the school. I knew loads of Daniels. So I wanted to be Daniel. I don't know what I was thinking. How many Daniels were there? Oh, there was loads. Like kind of in the like school, a, in the school, like, oh, loads of Dan. Dan Daniels called Dan, Danny, Dan. You couldn't shorten Craig. You, there was no sort of nickname for it. I didn't like it. So what you, what you need is a famous Craig. That's what you need. There to, wasn't any at that time. You might, are you the first? No, <laughs> Daniel Craig. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're, when you're at uni and you're doing these, was it like a weekly sort of drama club thing? Yeah, it was kind of weekends and I think maybe one evening in the week for a couple of hours. Was it all aiming towards uh, some sort of production? Yeah, so the, so the first um, drama society session that we all turned up to, there were about kind of 30 people who turned up. And the director um, and tutor said, OK, you know, we've got a lot of people. That's my phone being Don't worry, yeah, it's all right. Off. No, this is just utterly unprofessional. <laughs> It really, I don't, I don't know, I've got to not my out. words, ladies and gentlemen. Not my words. That it's, I didn't say that. <laughs> it's not the first time it's been said about me. And it won't Sorry, be the last. Sanjeev just wants to do a little it's, email. It's very, very important. Uh, thank you, Mr. Spielberg. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so with the rap, sort of 30 people who turned up, and so the drama teacher uh, said, Okay, we've got a lot of people here, so I'm going to do two productions, basically, a two one act sort of plays. And he said, and these were his words, he said, I'm going to have my A team which has got about, uh, I think, about 10 characters in it. Oh. And the other 20 will be in the other thing. And I just thought, I've got to get in the 18. So I kind of went up to him at the end of it, and um, at the end of the session, and I said, 
listen, I, you know, I heard you talking about the thing. Uh, I just need to tell you that I should be in your A team. And he said, and why is that? And I said, just experience. I mean, I'd done bugger all at this point. No school productions, nothing. And I said, uh, yeah, it's just experience, really. And he said, what? And I said, well, I said, uh, Shakespeare. And I basically just talked about uh, Julius Caesar that I'd done for kind of, you know, GCSE English. And he said, did you play out some Mark Antony? Obviously. And he said, blah, blah, blah. And he said, you do, have you done anything modern? And I had read in the Sunday Times the previous weekend, I'd read a review of Norman Conquests. Right. <laughs> and I said, Norman Conquests. And he said, who did you play? I said, Norman. Norman. <laughs> and he said, what was the production like? And I basically, I kind of praised the, the review. I kind of said... It was great. I mean, it was lavish production. I said the <laughs> set was brilliant. I said it kind of lacked a bit of energy at the beginning. <laughs> back to I said performances generally were, you, you know, pretty good. Uh, you know, uh, a little slow to start, but once you got into it. But I said, it's Aikborn for you. I mean, you know, you can't go wrong with Aikborn. I just basically spouted that whole thing. He's, he's got to have bought all that. And he, he said, yeah, oh. you're in. And I remember that um, the night before we're doing our first production, uh, the girl that I was having a lot of the scenes with, I was meant to be in bed with her, and I was just petrified about being in bed with her. We'd meant to be kind of like mock shagging under the sheets, and uh, uh, and I thought, I don't know, I don't know how to do this. This, this is going to. I mean, do you, you don't surely you don't really do it. I mean, just, but also, what do you do? And I kind of said, Hey, how about if I wear shades? And then when I take the sheets off, I'm wearing shades, and they're going. No, that's got nothing to do with the character. I was just finding ways of trying to kind of make it feel less kind of, uh, I don't know, ag- aggressive, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and then she said, oh, my parents are coming tomorrow. And I thought, that's it. Oh. That's it. They're going to beat me up afterwards. I'll be kind of like, th-. and I, I had to confess to her. And I said, and she said, why are you so nervous about this? And I said, I, I, I've never been on stage before. Oh, and she went, God. oh. And... It was kind of fine. I mean, it's it's that thing that, you know, a lot of actors say, which is you, you find yourself in the spot and suddenly you kind of go, oh, this feels really familiar. Do you, do you I know re- how to do, deal with it. Do you remember that that feeling, that, that first feeling when you were on? Yeah, it was a comedy. So it was as soon as I got the first laugh, really. And I thought... You're here. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, this right, is it. I think I know what I'm doing. Or trust, instinctively, I've done something and they've laughed. And so I did it intentionally because I thought it would be funny. They think it's funny. Now we have a connection. So now let me build on that a little yeah. bit. Um, so it started from that, really. And then I just did the the um, Drama Society productions for three or four years. And I remember saying to them, there were two drama tutors who would alternate each year. And I remember both of them sitting there. And I said to them, it's third year or something, and I said... Do you think, and both of you got experience in this, do you think I could have a career as an actor? And without thinking, they both in unison said no. They did not. And I didn't push it. I didn't, I didn't want to kind of hear any details. No, of course not. Um, Why do you think they just automatically said that? Because you were obviously progressing with the drama, the drama society stuff and enjoying yourself. Yeah, I do, you know, I don't really... No, I mean, I can, you know, I understand that not wanting to give false hope thing. Yeah. Because that's, I think, I, I've seen a little met a lot of people who've come a cropper because, you know, people close to them told them they were brilliant. Yeah, of course. They were geniuses. And it, it's one of the things that, I know I'm skipping ahead a bit, but when I, I went to a workshop, I mean, in terms of how I got started, but I went to a workshop and uh, there were two or three at a, theater, a small theatre company in London and there were about three people who were new and there were about a dozen people who were part of their sort of company. And the 12 people who were there, were, apart from one, were universally horrible to the three people who'd come in. And I knew nothing about theatre at all. And I'd gone in because I was interested and I was curious and all that kind of stuff. And they would throw things at me like, you know, they said, well... You, have you ever worked with uh, Max Stafford Clark? And I'd have to go, I, I, don't, I don't know who Max Stafford Clark is. And there would be these guffaws. And, and it was just horrible. And I remember kind of thinking uh, that one of, and they'd all been to drama school, and obviously I hadn't. And I remember thinking one of the things that had hindered them through the drama school experience was that 
they had got great parts at drama school. They'd been in great plays and they had, you know, really good parts in them and they had been schooled and they'd been taught and they'd been critiqued and they'd come out of it. And then every experience they had coming out after drama school, they came out thinking, you know, I'm Olivier. Yeah. You know, I'm the next Gilgood, you know, whatever. (laughs) And each job told them they weren't. And so they made up the difference between, you know, what they had been told and what they had felt and what the world was telling them by acting difficult and acting kind of like hierarchical and stuff like that. So when I then toured uh, with them, they were the ones that complained about, you know, every hotel room and, you know, the, the... faucets wonky and Uh. all that kind of stuff and I just thought that's where it's come from so I mean for me coming into it late as well because I was 33 when I started so um and no experience and no kind of uh uh, training and everything to me I was just stepping into wonderland I mean this was Narnia to me and this was kind of magical this was the stuff that I'd always dreamt him out and I'd watched and, you know, observed and you know, seen from afar. And now I was, I was in the middle of it. I thought, yeah. this is glorious. Hello. Hello, how are you? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, so I couldn't understand, looking at them, why they were difficult and why a wonky faucet in <clears throat> some sort of B&B when you yeah. went on tour, why was that important? It's kind of, this other stuff is amazing. And it's... It's the stuff that I still, you know, find magical is that, you know, the you, me, you know, other people, a group of us will come up and can come up with something that I could never come up with on my own. Yeah. And that to me is utterly magical, you know, whether that's working with a director or a script writer or set designers or, you know, people who do sound or, I mean, everyone pitches in their thing and makes something that I couldn't have done on my own. And I still find that. Fabulous. I find that fantastic. And I did then. I did then even with those drama society things. I, I, I did even though I was clearly better than everyone else. Um, <laughs> it's so funny because when you were talking about the drama society things, I was about to ask you before why the drama tutor didn't go, do you know what? I think you're doing the wrong thing at university. I think you should be popping over here and doing this full time. And for them to say no immediately mm. that you couldn't have a career what in did, unison without thinking. What did that do to your self esteem, or to what? Because it's obviously it was within you there. It was obviously something that you that wanted to come out, even though you were quite clearly doing the wrong course at university. Yeah, at yeah. the time, what did that do to you? I well, I was. The the one thing that was that that was tricky in terms of the drama society was that you were reliant on the productions they were doing. So uh, the productions in the last couple of years, there just wasn't anything suitable for me, and there wasn't anything particularly of value that I could see in being involved. You know, it was you know spear carrier, third spear carrier from the left type stuff, and I thought, I'm just, you know, I don't want to do that, so I'm just going to get bored. So I was at university with, um, we crossed over for a year, Nitin Sawney, sort of composer now for film and television, yeah. and um, is, is a genius, uh, musically just the most talented m- musician I've ever met. And we got chatting, and we had a very similar sense of humour. And so, you know, humour is infor- informed by sort of Monty Python and, and uh, the Marx Brothers and Goons and Woody Allen and all that kind of stuff. And we got talking and said, well, why don't we, there's nothing out there that reflects our experience of being both British and Asian. So why don't we do something together? So we started to do little kind of sort of stand up y type shows, just the two of us. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Was this did. after university or do you? No, this was at university. Was it? And we would kind of, because the fun thing was, again, getting together. You know, he was a phenomenal musician. So, you know, he could you know, very kind of tangibly come up with stuff that I couldn't. But I remember kind of saying, well, we'll just do characters and, and we'll just do them here at, in, the, in the student union bar or whatever. And so we would kind of like spend three or four weeks putting a show together. We'd do one show and that would be it for the year. We wouldn't bother doing any more. <laughs> We've done that now. Um, and so that became another creative outlet for me. So the, the, the drama stuff 
stopped. And also, you know, it was there were people of varying uh, abilities and interests in the drama society, and that's you know understandable. People yeah. who kind of just wanted to get out of doing physics for a while or whatever, and that's kind of fine. They were expressing themselves, which is great. But for me, it did mean a bit more, and I think it just meant more than it did for other people. So I just found my own way. So I started writing stuff and performing it there. Was it the sketches that you were writing? Yeah, they were sketch characters, yeah, yeah. really. And then um, years later, uh, when I went through a period of, um, which is another a difficult period that I went to, but I was unemployed at that time, I remember ringing Nitin Sawney and saying, look, you're, you know, I can't get work at the moment of any kind. And so... Um, I had a court case going on that I was involved in, so I couldn't get any kind of job because of that. And I said, but you're sitting around not doing anything, so why don't we just hang out and come up with stuff? And I said, there's still nobody reflecting our experience of being British and Asian. And so uh, it was fun. It was fun to... And then we put together a show, and it was just for ourselves, really. And um, and then said, well, maybe we should think about maybe doing it somewhere. It was fun before. And, and I said, we would be unpredictable. I said, let's be unpredictable. Uh, I said, no one will expect, you know, the next sketch to be you playing uh, a flamenco piece. So let's do that. And I said, then we'll, I'll do a character and then we'll sing Volare in Italian. And, and that's what we did. And we sort of put together a show. Just um, being healthy and being creative kept you going. Yeah, yeah. it just came. It, I mean, you know, being creative is, is a great life energy. I mean, it's not important necessarily that you do it uh, as a profession but I'm full of admiration and I have a greater connection with you know people who don't do it necessarily for as a profession but are passionate passionate mm. enough to you know pick up pencils or a paintbrush or an instrument or you know at a party get up and sing a song or whatever I kind of I get that I get yeah. that kind of thing I have more in common with them than I have about actors whinging about a you know a, a loose faucet <laughs> you know, in a and b somewhere. Yeah. It's kind of like, wow, guys, you... I mean, most people in the world work for a living, you know, and so if you're doing something, if you're lucky enough to be doing it, um, do it you know, your passion being your work, then... And it is difficult, and it's, and it's hard at times, mm. and it's not always plain sailing and all that kind of stuff. But you made the decision to pursue your passion. Now, you, you're... Your journey can change, and there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, so th- there are people who kind of were musicians or dancers or thing for a while and then thought, it's not for me, for whatever reason, and went in another direction. That's fine too. But when you're in it and you're doing it, you know, find the joy. Yeah, exactly. I think when the, joy's, the joy goes, maybe you should sort of yeah. get on the ad, try and find something else to do maybe. But also, it's, you know, it's, life's a journey. It's, yeah. it's, you haven't arrived at your final destination until you arrive at your final destination. Exactly. Before then, just be open to, to the Change. Your world around you. Yeah. yeah. So after university, you graduated from university, yeah. what, what did you do after that? Uh, I worked in marketing for about eight or nine years uh, in various jobs, um, initially in high-tech marketing. So my first job was at IBM. And then the subsequent jobs I had were all in that kind of high tech kind of area. You must have found some joy in that, though. No, no, not at all. No, not really. And how long? Eight or nine years. Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, no, I figured. You know, I thought my parents, you know, really, ideally, you know, want to want me to be a doctor. I want to be an actor, and I threw a series of kind of like complex um, physics equations. Uh, worked out that marketing was the dead centre between the two. Um, you know, there was an element of creativity about marketing, which I kind of liked. That was the part of it that I liked. Uh, but high tech, I was just not interested. And then I thought, well, I, I love the arts, so let me move into marketing the arts. And then I got um, a job with the with an arts council project, um, which was fine until it was it was it became. So it wasn't uh, within the Arts Council. It was a wholly funded external project. Uh, but it got to the stage where I had to sue them. Uh, so I sued them and they sued me. And then for two years, I couldn't get any kind of work at all because it was all tied up in, in uh, litigation. And um, so first, for first three months, I, I was hugely in debt. I was kind of I moved back in with my parents 
I was 30 and I was thinking, God, I'd re- I just, all I can see is an abyss. I mean, if this, if this ends up going against me, which it might, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to pay them back. I don't know how I'm going to pay the costs. I'll probably have to get a job in a factory like, you know, my dad did or something. That's kind of it. And that just, it was like staring down the barrel of a gun and wondering whether it was loaded or not. And um, so for three months, I remember going to the video shop. Videos, do you remember them? I do. Um, had to rewind them at the end before you handed them back, but no one ever did. I, re- I used to work in a video shop. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, it started, it started just like popping in and talking and then because of yeah. my real passion for films and I didn't want to get a paper round and I wasn't allowed a milk round because it was too early to get up. <laughs> Remember milk rounds? I did you one. Know, you did one? I did one for a, uh, two days. I just always used to want to hang off the back of the milk flow and my mum went, no, it's not safe enough. And plus you'll never get up at five o'clock in the morning. So I used to go into the video shop a bit before we had a video because uh, I used to collect the posters. Oh, right. Yeah, we yeah. had a video player and I begged my dad for a video player for ages and ages and ages because everybody had one, everybody had one. And he went, no problem. I've looked at the Witch magazine and I'm going to get a video player, brilliant, fantastic. Brought home a Betamax machine. Now, for <laughs> young people listening to this, there was two types of video players. There was a VHS, widely popular, a uh, huge array of titles that you could rent. And I think Betamax had about like, Ten Three. titles, <laughs> yeah, really, exactly. really poor choices. Yeah. Uh, and I remember my dad came home, usually starring Eric Estrada. A lot of Eric Estrada films. My dad came home with, uh, "We've got The Deer Hunter, and I've got Nightmare on Elm Street. Come on, we're having family <laughs> film night." My poor mum, she's just, uh, you know, I'm not sabotaging this this chat. So you end the video <laughs> shot. Come on. Uh, can I just tell you about the milk round? So I did the milk round for two days. Why only right. two days? Well, there were two reasons. One of what, well, first of which was that uh, I realised by the end of the first day it was the longest milk round in Western Europe. <laughs> it would we would start at five and finish at four in the afternoon. It was <laughs> awful. <laughs> Secondly, the milkman did the cliched thing of disappearing into no. a woman's house for half an hour, leaving me sitting in the milk float, and I thought that's just that's just not right. Proper that was the second thing. Third thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the third thing was that he, uh, the pay was awful, and I thought this is just not worth it. My dad said, "I said I'm not going to do this because the money's horrible. Get two pound fifty or something for a Saturday." And he said, "My dad said, has he said you can drink milk?" And I said, "Yeah, he did say you can help yourself to milk." My dad said, "You should make up the difference <laughs> in drinking milk." I said, "I had to drink about twelve pints to make up. I'm not doing that." And the third thing was that um, he said to me, and this was where the die was cast. Probably, uh, he said, uh, Ooh, "What's your name?" And I said, uh, "Sanjeev." And he said, "Hey," I said, "Sanjeev." And he said, "What?" I said, "Sanj." You can call me Sanj. And he went, "No, no, no. It's too complicated." He said, I'll call you Sam. And I said, I'll call you Horace. <laughs> and that was it. We were kind of, daggers were drawn. Pretty pathetic plastic daggers with sort of rubber bungs on the end. But the best. Um, but back to the video shop. Um, so if you um, went to the video shop and uh, hired videos and re- returned them by five o'clock, they were at like a quid. Yeah. And so I'd cycle down there, get three films, come home, watch them back to back, and then uh, return them. And I did that. Pretty solidly for about three months. And and then I bottomed out of that. I, I remember seeing a double bill, which was The Comfort of Strangers and Betty Blue. Oof. And I was sitting there so depressed at the end of it that I just thought, I've just hit the bottom. Yeah, that'll do it for you. And uh, I thought, I've got to get out. So uh, I contacted my local hospital, West Middlesex Hospital. Um, and I said, look, I, I, you've got a radio station. Can I come and be involved in that? And they said, yeah. So I turned up. Um, it was all volunteers. And, I, and they said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to present a show. And they said, well, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you can go around the wards collecting requests and, you know, stacking the, the uh, vinyl library and all that kind of stuff. So I did that. It was kind of two nights a week and I'd go down there, but it got me out of the house. Yeah. And it was during that time that I then rang Nitin Sawney and said, let's do something. Let's do something. At the end of that two years, um, the litigation, they settled out of court. So I got some of my money back. Um, and at that point I thought, uh, and during that time I'd, I'd gone to this workshop, 
they had said, I said, do I need any references? Because I'm, if I do, I'm seeing them in court next Tuesday. I'll, I'll ask them. And they said, no, no, you don't need it for, for the uh, acting stuff. And I said, fine. And they said, well, there's a little TIE tour. Um, and I said, okay, I don't know what that is. And they said, it's theatre and education. You go around schools and you do a performance, do workshops and stuff like that. And I did that. And uh, that kind of got me started. And then... Nitin and I started to put on these shows, which started to get a little following. Yeah. And then we did a show at the Oval House Theatre in South London. And in their studio space, there were 50 seats, 40 seats, something like that, small. And we got reviewed um, in Time Out. And we got a five-star blazing review did, yeah. from Bonnie Greer, who's a playwright yeah. herself. And... Uh, uh, and were sold out. And there were two producers from the BBC who came to see it um, uh, on the toss of a coin, as I kind of later found out, and then came backstage and said, look, we're thinking of doing a, a an Asian sketch show, and this is the material we're looking for. Would you be interested? And so that became Goodness Gracious Me. So a lot of the characters that I was doing with Nitin, I then did in Goodness Gracious Me. It's kind of life-turning moment. God, so all that started really at university, didn't it? Just you two doing your in, sketches. Yeah, in terms of in terms of being proactive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, obviously, I was five years old and thinking I'm oh, better than all these mugs around me. <laughs> the arrogance of youth. Yeah, you watch the nativity and you kind of go, bah. I remember. I mean, this was the thing. So you just reminded me. So in primary school, in the nativity, I was always one of the frigging three wise men from the east. <laughs> always except once because I then complained I said why do I have to be I, I, it was a challenge I kind of said why do I have to be one of the three wise men from the east <laughs> I've done it for the last two years and they said no you're right you're right so they made me and it took me some time to work out the irony of the phrase but they made me head sheep <laughs> so I was then head sheep um, but I remember with in, in their rehearsals I don't remember they did Aladdin one year and the guy, the boy who played Aladdin, uh, got the part because he had a he had a judo outfit which looked vaguely Eastern, which you don't, you know, it's, you got the sash and all that kind of stuff. But I remember during rehearsals they would stop and say, "Sanjeev, can you come and tell Andrew? Just show Andrew how to do that scene." No, I wouldn't get the part. But anyway, I'm over it now. That is Bastards. brilliant. I'm so pleased uh, you came back with that. Got a judo suit. <laughs> uh, uh, now, of course, there are times when you're grateful to be one of the three wise men from the East. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased you're wearing the judo suit for this chat, to Thank be honest, you. I, mate. I wanted it to be special. I'm glad it's comfortable house attire. <laughs> um, now, I, did, I mean, no, we don't really talk about... I've just found a leaf in the term up of my jeans. I'm just going to put it over there. Have you brought it from outside? I have. Is it, it a lucky have, leaf? We, we uh, got caught in a big rainstorm coming here. Um, do you think... Were you sad to stop, not to seriously stop, to put a hold on the sketch stuff? Did you think it got out of hand with its popularity? Because it did, it was, there was nothing like it on the telly. I don't really want to get too bogged down in jobs, but mm. I'm going somewhere with it. Um, there was nothing, we were talking about it before, there was nothing like it on telly at the time. And of course, I am going to have to point out the very famous going for an English mm. sketch. Mm. What effect did that have on you? Uh, it was strange. I mean, the, the I mean, you know, in terms of sketch shows, the Real McCoy was a, an all black sketch show that had uh, preceded Goodness Gracious Me, and you know, pros- possibly you know, laid some of the groundwork down for it. Mira had been involved in that. Mm. Um, but in terms of the success of Goodness Gracious Me, it was we did it on radio first, and so you know, you don't get recognised in the street from from that. But it was really lovely to get the feedback that it was, you know being sort of warmly embraced and all that kind of stuff. The thing with the telly thing was really weird. It was really weird because I was, you know, 33, 34 by then. And uh, then being recognised was kind of odd. Uh, I remember walking down the street in, down Upper Street in Islington uh, after the first series had gone out. And they had one of those sort of Australian pubs, walkabout type places. Yeah. And it was a really hot day. It was a sunny day. And as I walked, peripheral vision becomes really sharp at times, you know. And um, your antennae are up. 
and I was walking down Upper Street, and I could see outside this pub uh, three blokes having having a pint, and one was standing and was holding court with two who were literally sitting his, at his feet and looking up at him in a sort of mildly adoring way. And the two who were sitting on the floor were skinheads. I mean, they were your traditional kind of like, you know, green sort of uh, khaki jacket, yeah. bother boots kind of skinheads. And the guy who was uh, holding court, which now seems like an ironic term, actually, uh, was wearing a kind of like a judge's wig. What? I, you, know, I, I, you know, either he was... I, I mean, they were all drunk. I mean, either they were, he was on his way back from a, from a fancy dress party or he was a high court judge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember walking past and uh, the judge um, said, Oh, you! I thought, oh, you know, just keep walking. It's kind of fine. It's mid- middle of the day. It's fine. It's fine. Keep walking. He went, you, I'm talking to you. I thought, that's fine. You know, I'll be out of earshot within, you know, uh, 30 seconds. And he said, uh, you goodness gracious me, bloke. And I turned around and he said, uh, I've got a question for you. He said, chuddy. <laughs> he said, it's underpants, isn't it? And I said, yes, it is. And he turned around to his two minions and went, I told you, I fucking <laughs> told you. And they're going, yeah, no, you were right, mate. Yeah, I fucking told you as well. No, you were right. And I thought, sorry, I might turn my mic. And I thought, wow, that's, it's really crossed over. In terms of me personally, in my head, the thing that, that, that I kind of again realised in retrospect was actually for five years. So that, that ran for three series. And then I did the, the Kumars at number 42 kind of uh, came after that. I realised that um, for, for the first five years, I still felt like an utter failure. And that was just... A failure? Yeah, because I'd grown up with that. I'd grown up, uh, you know, my... my um, uh, exam grades weren't great. I didn't do the A-levels I wanted to do, so they were shit and I retook them. I didn't do the degree I wanted to do. Um, you know, the first jobs at IBM weren't great. I, You know, the, then I had the litigation thing. So it was, you know, all that stuff uh, which tell, you know, the, then when you look back on it and you kind of look at the catalogue, you kind of go, everyone stopped talking to me at school. It was kind of, that shit happened, you know, the, the counter-racism stuff. And you kind of go... Shit, you know, I've not succeeded at anything. And so internally, I still had that emotional state, although around me, what was building up were all these very kind of overt signs of as people may define success, which is you, you're doing well, you're kind of, you know, uh, my debts were now kind of paid and I'd bought a place in Islington. And, and that was the thing. I think when I bought uh, a flat in Islington, I remember thinking that was where I kind of went, do you know what? I can't, I can't be a failure. I can't see myself as a failure. These kind of, this bricks and mortar, this is mine. I own it and I've earned it. Yeah. And it's, and that was, that was a turning point, but that was kind of, you know, sort of four or five years of being on telly or people, you know, other people's, the, the problem is, you know, that success and failure is generally defined by other people. And then we either buy into it or we don't. Yeah, And so, owning and be able to assess your own self-worth is something that we are not taught to do because as a child your parents tell you whether you're good or bad right or wrong then your teachers tell you good or bad right or wrong then it might be a boss that tells you you go into a relationship you know and there's that bit where you're looking for that affirmation am I being good am I bad and everyone's doing it and so at what point do you kind of go okay let me define you know my self-worth you know, and lack of it and where it needs work and where it's overdeveloped and all that kind of stuff. There's no lesson that teaches you that other than life lessons. And then you kind of work it out. And if you're really lucky, you meet kind of fantastic people along the way who kind of guide you in the most benign way. And so I remember saying to a friend of mine uh, once, um, I said, I've just worked out. He's a really good friend, no longer with us, unfortunately. But I remember saying to him, I've just worked out what the best thing you could ever say to me is. And he said, well, what's that? And I said, I don't believe you. And he said, why is that? And I said, because if you say that to me, I said, my first question is going to be, do I believe me? Because I've got the ability to fool myself 
as much as anyone else has. Anyone who's creative has the ability to kind of see themselves as, you know, the worst thing in the world or the best thing in the world. And I said, but I know that you really care about me. You're, you genuinely care about me. There's no angle to anything that you say to me. So if you say, I don't believe you, I'm going to think, do I believe me? Am I fooling myself? And if I think, no, I'm not, then it's a chance for me to put it more clearly to you. And that was, that was a kind of light bulb moment for me in terms of relationships yeah. and, uh, and friendships and all that kind of stuff. And also that just finally being aware that um, I can't trust my own judgments if I'm feeling really down, really upset, really lost, any really. Um, I, how can I be the best judge of that? So I need to have people around me that I can go, you will tell me who I am when I don't know who I am. I had about so many other questions to ask you, but I'm going to leave it there because I think that's a really beautiful, poignant place to You're leave You're going to it. sing the song now, aren't you? I am. You're going to sing the song? You said you weren't going to sing the song. I've got my <laughs> coat on, I've got my hat, got my bag. Sanjeev, thank you so much, my friend. That was so brilliant. Oh, thank you. Cheers, thank you. There we go. Another episode down, another brilliant, honest episode down. How great was that? Did you enjoy it? I loved it. I loved sitting here with Sanjeev, telling me all those stories. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. I hope you found it entertaining. Um, uh, I hope you found it inspiring, maybe. Either way, it's all good. Thanks so much for listening. We're really chuffed. Did I tell you we've started a Patreon page? It's patreon.com forward slash Two Shot Podcast. If you're enjoying it, then maybe you want to bungle us a bit of money every month. It's just to keep the podcast going. We do this off our own back. Um, I'm looking at producer Griff's shoes. They're quite holy. And uh, the water's getting in. He might uh, need to buy some new trainers. It's not for that. It's not for trainers or clothes or anything. It's just for the episodes to keep the podcast going. And uh, we'd love you to come on board. Go check out the page. See what you can do. If you can't afford anything, then don't worry. Just keep on listening and supporting and subscribing. You can follow us uh, on all social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Two Shot Pod. Uh, and we will see you next time. Oh, listen, if you want to drop us an email and let us know what you're thinking of the podcast, that would be great. We are at Two Shot Pod. Not at Two, no, that's the social media. The email address is twoshotpod at gmail.com. It'd be lovely to hear from you. And until next week, I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff. This has been the Two Shot Podcast. Good night. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers. Cheers.